Hey everybody, welcome to this month's Journal Club. So uh, I'm Dr. Oliver Medvedic presenting uh, this Journal Club brought to you by uh, Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, LEAF. Um, normally I'm at my lab at the Cooper Union, but because everything is still shut down due to, um, well, we know what, uh, I'm actually broadcasting from my bedroom and my private library here and everybody else is situated um, in various far-flung places uh, in their own rooms. So we're bringing you a extra special journal club um, that's going to be actually um, uh, directed by João Pedro de Miguelis um, and Roberto. Um, and they'll be discussing a really fascinating paper that uh, normally we, we talk about um, uh, scientific pay primary scientific literature that deals with topics uh, either in vitro work or in vivo work uh, but this is a um, analytics paper that deals with a very useful very powerful tool uh, for the aging community it's the cell age database uh, that was set up and um, this database contains information on 279 genes um, for more I guess um, this moment, but it's 279 genes on cell that uh, regulate cellular senescence. And the features of this database, and um, I guess how it can be utilized properly by researchers around the world, um, will be covered uh, in this journal club. So without much further ado, um, I'd like to turn the reins over to uh, Pedro. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and for the very kind words, Oliver and Steve and everyone in the uh, lifespan IO. Um, so I'll, um, I guess I'll start sharing my screen. And I mean, what I'll do is I'll, I'll um, start with a brief introduction and then I'll tell you about this uh, latest paper we published in which Roberto uh, was involved and also other people from our lab and collaborators. So give me one second and I'll start sharing my screen. Okay. Um, okay, so can you see my slides properly? Good. Um, so that's great. And, um, and you will focus on this recent paper of ours that uh, um, relates to this new tool we've developed, this database called CellAge, a database of genes associated with cells and essence, and various analyses we've done um, related to, uh, to cells and essence. So, uh, I mean, I guess you've probably seen the, my next slide or some versions of it, which is that, you know, the reason we're doing all of these online and virtually and all this disruption to, to, to research and to life is because of uh, coronavirus, which of course is a very clear age-related diseases. Um, this is data from China that shows um, mortality uh, with age. And as you can see below the age of 50, mortality is quite low. Um, however, it starts to increase exponentially with age and over the age of 80, mortality is quite significant. So it's clearly an age-related disease. So, uh, you know, if, I mean, I'm pretty to convert it here, but uh, if we need one more reason to, um, to tackle aging, that would be COVID-19. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, there's already a lot of knowledge in terms of uh, genetics of aging. So, I mean, back when I was a PhD student, I started this collection of resources called um, the Human Aging Genomic Resources, which contains various databases and tools to study the genetics and biology of aging. And I mean, this now have hundreds of citations, hundreds of thousands of visitors. Um, and I guess I would highlight the the GeneAge database of aging-related genes that really is the benchmark database of how much we progressed in terms of our understanding of the, uh, the gerontome, the genetic basis of aging in, in mortal organisms. Um, so, you know, this has been going on for years. And I guess as a sign out, I would also point out if you're interested in the latest news regarding the biology of aging, I also maintain pages on, on Facebook and Twitter with the latest papers on the biology of aging. So, okay, so there's been a lot of progress on the genetics of aging in animal models. Um, and as I said, we have these various databases already, in particular GeneAge. Um, but this project focuses, of course, on another very timely topic, which is cell senescence, um, which is, you know, essentially cells that should be dividing, but they don't anymore. 
And this was, I'm sure you're familiar, it's been studied initially by, well, discovered initially by Len Hayfig and Paul Mohart. Um, and they uh, uh, discovered that normal human cells um, have a finite lifespan in vitro. They can only divide a certain amount of times. Um, and now the hypothesis at least is that there's an accumulation of senescent cells in tissues with age, either because of replicative senescence or because of stress-induced senescence. Um, and these in turn result in a, um, a disruption of tissue function um, and an increase in chronic inflammation also do because senescent cells secrete um, inflammatory cytokines, what's called known as SASP, um, senescence associated secretory phenotype that is thought to contribute to chronic inflammation with, a, I'm sure you're aware, increases with age. We have this inflammaging, as Claudio Franceschi coined, this increase in inflammation with age. Um, and there's a lot of efforts as well by labs and companies to try to target this using particular drugs, in particular senolytic drugs, maybe drugs that kill senescent cells specifically, um, that would, in theory, ameliorate the, the aging phenotype. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of interest in particular since the works of um, uh, the Mayo Clinic, Ian van Dersen's lab and colleagues at the Mayo Clinic who, who showed that ablation of senescent cells in adult mice um, results in an extended lifespan and uh, um, amelioration of aging phenotypes, at least in some mouse tissues, not all of them. So there's a lot of interest in, in this topic. And I mean, I should say, historically, I actually did my PhD in cell senescence and telomeres. I didn't work on it for several years, basically because I didn't think cell senescence was important in organismal aging. Um, but really after this uh, works from the Mayo Clinic, I thought, all right, so, so I was wrong. You know, I think senescent cells do seem to play some role in aging, although exactly what our role is remains unknown. And I'll, I'll actually come back to that a little bit later. So, okay, so it's a very important timely topic. And given that we have a number of databases already, one of the things we've developed was this cell edge database of genes associated with cell senescence. I mean, I should point out that these are young and old fibroblasts. This is actually from my PhD. So this is um, nearly 20 years ago now. So maybe 15, 16 years ago now. So you have young fibroblasts here on the left, uh, which you can see they tend to be smaller, more homogeneous. Then you have senescent cells, which they, all over the place, some of them are big, others are small, they're morphologically more heterogeneous. Um, and they have a number of other markers. So to define the, so what is a gene associated with cell senescence? So this is based a, on genetic manipulation. So you need to knock out, silence, overexpress a particular gene in human cell lines, could be cancer cell lines, but it has to be in human cell lines. So it has to be a human gene that you manipulate in human cell lines and that either induces um, senescence or it retards or prevents senescence. So one example would be telomerase. If you uh, activate um, the RNA component of telomerase, if you activate telomerase in human cells, uh, you have um, you know, the cells no longer reach replicative senescence. So that would be an example of a gene um, that is associated with cell senescence and would be on cell age. Um, and we have identified 279 human genes. That's the, the current version, although actually Roberto, who's, who's here on the call as well, he's been preparing a new build, uh, um, a new version of the database that will have um, considerably more genes. So, but anyway, going back to, to, to the, the database. So we have 279 genes and these are classified in different uh, ways. So first of all, there's different types of senescence. So what Leonard Hayflake initially discovered was replicative senescence. So cells divide for a certain amount of time and then they stop dividing. So that would be replicative senescence. But there's also uh, stress-induced senescence and uh, oncogene-induced senescence. And so in our database, we aggregate that information. So we have genes associated with different types of senescence and this is indicated. Um, and then in addition, you can also have genes that promote senescence and genes that inhibit senescence. So, you know, depending on the effect. So if you knock out a gene in a cell, 
depending on whether it's activating senescence um, or inhibiting it, you can classify it. You can also overexpress the gene and then also depending on the effect that's going to have on, on the phenotype, you can classify the gene as a promoter or an inhibitor of cell senescence. Um, so we have various levels of classification of genes associated with cell senescence. That, that's the point. Um, I mean, the database is now available. So, you know, obviously I'm very welcome to visit it and browse through it. I mean, just very briefly, because obviously, you know, you, you can browse through it. The point is that you can obtain information and you can browse the data depending on various um, criteria, um, including cell types, including cell lines, um, including whether it's a cancer cell line or not, the type of effect, what is promoting or inhibiting cell senescence, um, et cetera. So all the data is annotated and curated um, to, to a certain uh, level of detail, and you can browse through it as you wish, and you can also download the data. So that's, that's, the, that's the database is now uh, available um, online. So as I said before, we have different classifications and, and just to give an idea of what type of genes we have. So the majority of genes are replicative senescence. Um, so when we look at genes that either inhibit or induce cell senescence, the majority are replicative senescence, but we also have oncogene-induced and stress-induced senescence. Um, and genes that have mold, more than one classifier, actually, um, uh, based on different experiments. Uh, but the majority is replicative senescence. Um, and then, so then what we've done is we've characterized this data set, this um, a cluster, this, this group of genes associated with cell senescence um, in human cells, and we classified it and we did various analyses. So, um, I mean, one of the first things we did was we did a functional enrichment of genes associated with cell age genes. So what are the go categories? What are the functional annotations associated with genes associated with senescence? Um, and these were you know, things you would expect, like DNA repair, like uh, signal transduction and P53 uh, signaling, aging as a category as well. So mostly, I, I think that was not particularly surprising. It was more reassuring than anything about um, the, the functional categories associated with cell senescence. We also look at the evolution of, of genes associated with cell senescence, so of the cell age gene. And what we observe is that genes associated with cell senescence, or so the cell age, they tend to be more evolutionary conserved in vertebrates than expected by chance. So what you see here is um, the percentage of orthologs in humans in various species like yeast, worms, and flies, and then in mammals, mouse, rats, and monkeys. And the, the, the percentage of orthologs um, in cell age is higher than expected by chance than the genome-wide average, which is what you see here in, uh, in green uh, as compared to red. And that's true for, for all the species we tested. So these genes tend to be more conserved than, evolution, than evolutionary more conserved than expected by chance, which I guess is not too surprising because we know cell senescence occurs in, in different species of, of mammals. Uh, I mean, we, a couple of years ago, we published a paper on cell senescence in, um, in naked mole rats, for example. And so it, it would be expected by contrast in vertebrates, they don't really have cell senescence like worms and flies. So you would expect you wouldn't expect such a conservation of genes associated with a phenotype that is not present in these organisms. Um, we've also looked into um, genes that were conserved across a larger groups uh, of species. So in humans, you have the 279 genes, um, and they tend to be well conserved. There's 22 genes that are conserved across all mammals that we tested. Um, although I, I should say, obviously, there, there are some issues here in terms of, you know, genome quality. So if you have a genome with a lower quality, you might miss some of these genes. Um, but there were also 128 genes associated with cell senescence that are present in uh, long-lived species like humans, mole rats, whales, bats, and elephants. Um, so again, there tends to be quite a strong conservation of these genes. Um, the other thing we did that then was interesting it was, okay, we looked into the expression of these genes in human tissues. 
So during normal aging. So what you see here on the left is are various tissues, adipose tissue, adrenal gland, blood, etc. These are all human tissues. And then what we did was we looked for uh, genes that are differentially expressed with age. So using um, human data from uh, publicly available data from the GTX consortia, we looked into genes that change, they get up or down during aging. And then we look, okay, so how much do they overlap with the genes in cell age? And in terms of genes that inhibit cell senescence, there wasn't much of a pattern, but in genes that promote cell senescence in gene age, uh, I'm sorry, in cell age, um, there is an overrepresentation of tissues in which these genes tend to be overexpressed. So these are genes that inhibit cell senescence. Here are genes that promote cell senescence. And then you have under and over. Here, there's not much of a pattern, but here there is a pattern in which you find more tissues with these genes being overexpressed with age um, than would be expected by chance. So, I mean, clearly that's not all the tissues. That's not even most of the tissues, um, but there are more tissues than you'd expect. So what this allows to say is that, okay, so genes that promote cell senescence, they tend to be overrepresented uh, amongst age tissues, or they tend to have higher levels uh, amongst some age tissues, not all of them. Sorry, um, Pedro, if I could jump in really quickly. I think it's also important to point out that in, in vitro, these genetic manipulations will not uh, just one one in vitro manipulation will will influence the senescence phenotype. So we don't necessarily expect a lot of these genes to be changing. Um, maybe even just one or two is enough to influence the, the senescence phenotype of age. We're not entirely sure about in vivo. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, the other thing I would point out is that you can see here the uterus is a quite striking exception, and I'll come back to it in a little bit, um, in that actually it's the opposite. You see that genes that promote cell senescence in the uterus, they actually tend to be downregulated with age, which is the opposite you see, and very clear results, the opposite you see in, in uh, other tissues. Um, and as I said, I'll come back to it because that, that fits other results as well. Um, so, the other thing, uh, analysis, so we did, we had all these 279 genes associated with cell senescence based on genetic manipulations. Um, the other thing we looked at was genes that are differentially expressed in cell senescence. Um, so, I mean, our lab has been doing uh, signatures of aging, of caloric restriction, I mean, different gene expression signatures um, for, for several years. Um, as I said, we derived this from, from aging, from uh, um, caloric restriction. Actually, when we derived signatures of aging, we found some genes associated with cell senescence like P16 being overexpressed or being part of the signatures of aging in mammalian tissues. Um, but so as part of this work, we also wanted to have a, a gene expression signature of cell senescence. So briefly, um, so what we did was, uh, um, a signature of cell senescence. So based on microarray data from the GEO, which is publicly available data. So we obtained 20 data sets from GEO of um, gene expression changes that occur during cell senescence in vitro, okay? Um, and then we basically did a meta-analysis. So I won't go into all of the details. Actually, this gene expression signature, although it's, it's gene age, actually, we published it last year in another paper. Um, but basically you aggregate all of these 20 studies into a, a single signature. So you rank all of these genes and then you determine based on the false discovery rate, which genes are being more overexpressed or underexpressed in cell senescence than expected by chance based on random permutations. So again, I mean, the statistics, uh, I can go through it in more detail if you wish later, but it's, it's basically just, finding this, this conserved signature of cell senescence across multiple cell types and multiple studies. Uh, so we found that we derived this um, cell senescence signature and it's composed of quite a lot of genes, I think actually, um, over 500 genes that are overexpressed in cell senescence and over 700 genes that are underexpressed or downregulated in cell senescence um, or they're commonly um, overexpressed and underexpressed in cell senescence. So we have this 
gene expression signature of cell senescence, which we also incorporate into the, the analysis. So again, we looked into tissues, um, similar to previously, but uh, this time instead of being genes associated with cell senescence based on genetic manipulations, they're based on differential express, so genes differential expressed in cell senescence. Um, and we found a, a similar pattern uh, in terms of genes. So you see genes underexpressed in cell senescence, and you here on the right see genes overexpressed in cell senescence. And again, not all tissues show it, and there are exceptions. In particular, the uterus is a very clear exception. But again, you find a higher number of tissues than would be expressed by chance that with age, human tissues with age, they have um, overexpression uh, of genes um, also differentially expressed with cells and essence. So you do see, again, there are exceptions, but you do see a, um, a greater number of genes being overexpressed um, in age human tissues that are in turn also associated with cell senescence. So you could say that you do see some signatures, some gene expression signatures of cell senescence. You see this uh, in, uh, in age human tissues as well. Um, and I mean, as I said, this was something that we've published last year as well. And this was just an analysis by, by um, Cassett uh, from our lab that we, were, we published last year. Um, and this is a similar pattern um, for, for some tissues where you see a down regulation um, of genes with age associated with, um, well, sorry, you see a downregulation with age of genes that are also downregulated in cell senescence, and you see an upregulation with age as genes that are upregulated in cell senescence, with one notable exception, that is the uterus. But in most tissues, that's the pattern you see. Um, so that's, that's quite consistent with the, the other results from cell age. Um, we've also then looked into the relation between cell senescence and, uh, and cancer. So, I mean, without going into much detail, I'm sure you're aware that cancer incidence increases with age. And well, cancer mortality, some cancers mortality increases with age, but not all of them. There's some exception. And I mean, this review I did a few years back goes into more details. But the idea that cell senescence is involved in cancer and, and it's involved in, in this uh, predisposing tissues to cancer has is, is also been around for a while. So we also looked into the overlaps between the genes associated with cell senescence, both from mutations, I'm sorry, from genetic manipulations um, and from gene expression and cancer. And probably not too surprising, we found a strong overlap. So what you see here is the overlap between genes associated with cell senescence from cell age and both oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. So among genes that promote cell senescence, there's uh, an overlap with both oncogenes, but and also in particular with tumor suppressor genes, uh, and amongst genes that inhibit cell senescence, uh, there's a particular overlap with oncogenes. So that's that's I, I guess that's not too surprising because we know there's a role of cell senescence in uh, tumor suppression and, and cancer. Um, likewise, when we look at gene expression level, we see similar patterns. So when you look at genes associated with uh, cancer, um, I'm sorry, when you see genes differentially expressed in cell senescence um, and uh, differentially expressed in cancer, um, you'll see also a very strong overlap, although in opposite directions. So what you see here are genes that are downregulated in cancer um, and this in all the tissues we tested in cancer and different cancers in different organs, you see that genes that um, are upregulated in cell senescence, they tend to be downregulated in cancer and vice versa. In uh, cancers, genes that tend to be upregulated in cancer tend to be genes that in cell senescence tend to be downregulated, which makes sense because cell senescence of course is cells not proliferating and cancer is quite the opposite. His cells proliferating way more than they should. So I see this as um, opposite uh, phenotypes. And so it makes sense that you see these very clear patterns of opposite gene expression changes between cancer and cell senescence. And also gives way to the idea that cell senescence is a tumor suppressor mechanism uh, as, uh, as I think it's quite well established. 
Um, so that's still, those are the patterns we identified in terms of uh, comparing cell senescence and, and both aging and, and cancer. Now, the, the, the last part, I guess, of the analysis that I will focus is in more on the network analysis perspective. And I mean, the point is that, and I've been saying this for years in, in terms of aging, is that, okay, we know of lots of genes associated with aging or longevity or cell senescence, but really genes don't work by themselves. They interact with each other. And we need to understand this interaction. We need to understand the system um, as a whole, as opposed to just individual genes. And then there's various kinds of analysis we can do. Um, so one very basic analysis we've been doing for many years is this uh, guilt by association. So if you have a network of proteins, um, for example, associated with longevity, um, and you have proteins not yet associated, if a protein not yet associated with longevity it interacts with a number of proteins in turn associated with longevity, then by chance it is more likely to be associated with longevity as well, this unstudied protein. And you can do statistics and you can identify, classify and rank um, genes and proteins for further testing based on this guilt by association approach. And I mean, we've done this in context of longevity, aging, cancer and so on. I mean, uh, we did this several years ago in, um, in East where we looked at genes associated with um, dietary restriction and we found, you know, we show that this network guided approaches can derive um, biologically relevant results. So we tested nine candidate genes, eight of which were actually associated with uh, dietary restriction. And I mean, we published several papers on this already. Um, and the other thing we do, we've done is we've developed some, some tools to, um, to do this kind of analysis, uh, most notably gene friends which was uh, um, developed by, by Sipko Van Dam, which was a PhD student in our lab. And um, so this is essentially a, a, a co-expression tool and database for performing network analysis and for various analysis, um, which showcases how you can use this and, and then how we did it also with CellEdge. So now, now actually, um, GeneFriends employ RNA-seq data. So basically, so what we do is we basically get all of the RNA-seq data we can get our hands on. And then we uh, look into, um, across all of the data, we look at how strongly genes tend to be co-expressed with each other. And that includes non-coding genes. Um, so it's, it's not just protein coding genes. We have over 80,000 transcripts, thousands of non-coding RNAs. So basically what you end up having is this, uh, you do this big data approach, and then you derive this matrix of, 80,000 transcripts by 80,000 transcripts. Um, and between them, you have a number to indicate how strongly they tend to be co-expressed. And the hypothesis, which you know, has been shown before, is that genes that tend to be co-expressed tend to be more likely to be functionally related. What it means is that if you have a, a particular gene that you don't know the function of, you can employ this to uh, infer its function. So for example, an unstudied gene, if it tends to be co-expressed with mitochondrial genes, then you can hypothesize or you can predict that it's also going to be associated with mitochondrial functions and that you can test experimentally. Also, if you have a group of genes, for example, associated with aging or cell senescence, you can um, use that as a set least to using the guilt by association method to identify more genes that are in terms or maybe in turn associated with cell senescence. Um, so that's something we've developed and that you, you can find online. Um, and so we've applied these methods and we've applied uh, to, to cell age and to build networks of cell senescence. So we built uh, a network of um, a co expression network of cell senescence, which is what you see here. Um, and it's quite interesting because each of this cluster, so it, it it creates different clusters, and each of these clusters is a different function. So I don't remember exactly which colors correspond to which functions, but this would be some. This will be in a paper, uh, and these are functions related to to processes you'd expect, like cell division, DNA repair, immune system. So processes that you'd expect associated with cell senescence. Um, but it's quite interesting also because it gives you a um, a bird's eye view of really all of the, of the network 
of genes associated with cell senescence and how these different functions work with each other. All the different functions associated with a cell senescence phenotype. Um, then in addition to that, we also wanted to use this uh, network biology approaches to identify new genes associated with cell senescence. So, I mean, we did various analysis um, using co-expression, using also protein interaction uh, networks, um, in incorporating gene expression data, not incorporating gene expression data. Um, but basically, eventually we derive a set of 26 candidate cell senescence genes from these network approaches. Um, so for example, you can look at hubs. So a hub would be a protein that interacts with a lot of other proteins in the network. Um, or something called bridging adapters, which is what you see here in green, which would be uh, a gene or a protein that connects different parts of the network. So, so we can use these different approaches um, to, to derive candidates and to classify and to, to prioritize, to rank candidates for experiments. Um, and so, and then in collaboration with uh, Cleo Bishop and, and others at um, at Queen's Mary University of uh, London, we tested this uh, experimentally. So, so what you see here are, are the results of this experiment. So on the left, you have the, the name of the genes that uh, we tested experimentally. Uh, and then each row, I'm sorry, and then each column represents a different uh, marker of senescence, you know, cell number, cell area, nuclear area, and, and things like um, uh, P16 and P21, um, uh, which are established markers of cell senescence. Um, and it was quite interesting because uh, we actually found quite a lot of heads. Uh, so they tested this, uh, as I said, so uh, Cleo and, and um, Halley Tyler did these experiments in London. Um, they used it, I think, uh, a breast cancer uh, cells, if I remember correctly, and they used RNAi to silence these genes. Um, and it was quite interesting because of the 26 genes tested, six of which were uh, strong heads. Um, in other words, when you um, silenced uh, 26 genes, six of them result in multiple biomarkers of senescence being induced. And 12 of them were moderate hits, that is some biomarkers of senescence being uh, induced, which is quite interesting because, you know, I think that's, a, that's more than half of the genes we tested, um, they, uh, they induce some level of senescence. So again, they show that we can use this network guided approaches to, um, to derive biologically significant results, in this case, new genes associated with cell senescence. Um, so, um, so just to, to finish, so we, we published this paper a couple of months back. Um, and I mean, so Roberto was here and he can add anything I forget. <laughs> um, uh, was one of the driving forces behind it. And also, well, Javier, uh, one of my former students who's now in Australia, Robbie who was previously in our lab and now he has his, his own lab in Romania. As I said, uh, Ellie Tyler in London, a number of other people from our lab as well um, and collaborators, including Vadim in Israel with whom we've uh, been collaborating for several years um, in our databases. Um, I mentioned Clio already in London. Um, so there was really, this was a project I should say, I think we started, if I remember correctly, in 2015. Uh, I think Robbie was the person who started it uh, when, when he was in, uh, in our lab. Um, so we started this project quite a long time ago uh, and it's, fun. It's, it's almost, it's a relief really to see it come to fruition. Um, I'm, I'm more relieved than happy at this point. <laughs> so, um, so it's great that we've um, we finally got this out there, and I really hope this cell age is, uh, becomes an important tool for the research community. So, so in conclusion, I guess uh, I'd say that uh, we've um, so we've developed this cell age database of cell senescence genes, which is is not the first database, but it's I would say is the first comprehensive database of cell senescence combining both. Uh, genes associated with cell senescence from genetic manipulations uh, and also uh, gene expression profiles of, of cell senescence. Then when you look at genes promoting senescence, I, I do think it's quite interesting you see this upregulation with age in 
some human tissues, not all of them, but in some of them, um, which you also see at, the, at the, the gene expression level, you see genes associated with uh, cell senescence being more overexpressed in human tissues than expected by chance. Um, so, well, so you see this. However, I would point out actually that, you know, obviously it doesn't happen in all tissues and there are clear exceptions, one of them being the uterus. So I also think that the other way of swing, so I think there's two ways of interpreting these results that I would point out now, which is one way is, okay, this is great. You should see that genes that are associated with cell senescence, promoting cell senescence and upregulating cell senescence, they tend to go up with age in, um, in more tissues than expected by chance. That's good. Okay, so um, that fits the hypothesis that cell senescence is important in aging. However, you can also look at it on the other way, which is, okay, so if cell senescence is so important for aging, how come there's tissues where you don't see an upregulation? How come there's tissues like the uterus, when actually what you see is a completely opposite pattern, where you see uh, a downregulation of genes associated with cell senescence? Um, and the uterus, I mean, physiologically, I, I guess it's quite interesting because it's a... Um, uh, it's an organ in which there's an increase in cell proliferation in older women, so, so which fits with our gene expression profiles that we observe. But then, okay, why, why, does, the, why does that happen? You know, so how then you can say that cell senescence is really this major driving of aging when you don't see evidence uh, of cell senescence in all human tissues or even most of them. You only see it in a subset of them. So that's, I mean, that's something just, just to consider. Uh, and lastly, we did this, all of these network approaches that, that review processes and, uh, and new genes associated with cell senescence. And of course, I, I invite you to, to, to use our website. And uh, I mean, I'm a very fond of open science, you know, and, and sharing data and making it as easy as possible for, for researchers to, to study the process of aging and cell senescence. So what I really want is for people to, to use our tools and use our databases um, because there's only so much analysis we can do um, and do their own analysis and incorporate this into their own work. Um, I mean, lastly, the, the one thing I would point out is that actually since we published our paper, there's been several papers on cell senescence that I thought were quite interesting. Um, I would point out, I think to me, the most interesting was this work from Dimitri Bulavin in Nice, which basically, I mean, without going into a lot of detail, basically shows that actually if you ablate a lot of senescent cells, this could be detrimental to mice. So there are some senescent cells that are important for, um, for tissues. Um, uh, Judy Campisi and others has also shown this, I think, in the lung, if I remember correctly. So you do need some type of senescent cells. I mean, if you just eliminate all senescent cells um, in an organism, that seems, or in a mouse, that seems to be uh, detrimental. Um, so, so senescent cells don't just have negative functions or detrimental functions in an organism. They also have normal functions. So again, that's just something to, to think about. Um, so with that, let me just you know thank, uh, I think I mentioned most of the people involved in all of these works. So I would just, um, again, point out Roberto, who did a lot of the analysis on, on cell age. Uh, also Cassid here, who, uh, who did um, a lot of the analysis in the context of cell senescence and cancer, uh, and also at the level of the gene expression signatures of cell senescence. Um, and, uh, and people like uh, um, Dominic and uh, uh, also that, uh, um, Emily and others that contributed to, uh, and Daniel Thornton that contributed to um, to our databases, including to to Cell Age. So, so there was a lot of people involved in this work, I should say, uh, and of course all of the funding sources um, that supported us, including the the Wellcome Trust and BBSRC, who support our databases, um, and also the and Longe City who supported some of our work also on, uh, on cell senescence and specifically this work on, uh, on cell age, um, without whom we wouldn't uh, be able to perform all of this um, work. So thank you very much for your time and attention and uh, be uh, glad to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Pedro. And I think, um... Steve, we have some questions in the chat, don't we? We do. Um, 
if we can uh, shut down the screen share and get our faces, that, that would be great. Um, I have already uh, lined up uh, a couple of questions from John Marlowe there. The first one he asks is, what genomic platforms are used to a, a certain uh, expression in this study? Uh, I'm particularly interested in sequencing. So in, in this particular study, we just use microarray data. Um, I guess uh, the reason for that was because we started deriving this gene expression signatures already a few years back and there were relatively few or very few RNA-seq data sets. Uh, and so in order not to mix RNA-seq and the microarrays, we just use microarrays. Um, having said that, I would be quite, um, quite interested in, um, in incorporating more data into the cell um, senescence gene expression signatures, including RNA-seq data. Um, uh, I think that would be quite interesting. Yes. I'm um, sorry if I can chip in. Of the 20 studies for the gene expression signatures, 10 were derived from human fibroblasts. So I think there's probably some, like a bit of bias towards the fibroblast cell type within the signatures. So there's probably, it's probably worth looking at other types as well to get a more expanded set of signatures. It's a good answer, right? Um, hopefully that, that satisfies uh, John's curiosity there. Um, can I, I mean, if I can add something, I don't know, I, I thought Roberto, my point is out because one of the things that is interesting now as well is single cell sequencing. And there's um, quite a few data sets now on single cell sequencing, although mostly from mice, not from humans. Um, there's one or two in aging for humans, but not much. Um, and so the other interesting aspect that we're now exploring, and I mean, Roberto is involved in this, is looking into markers of cell senescence in using single cell data. Uh, so I, I think that's something that uh, uh, I think would be quite, um, I think quite, quite interesting. We're quite interesting in exploring. Right. And uh, yeah, we've got, we've got some more questions. If anybody in here has a question, you can um, now unmute yourself. I have, uh, I have given everybody the power. So, uh, I'm so, not going to do the song. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hello, Didier. You yes. are hello. coming through loud and clear. Yeah. Um, so, um, very short. So, it, it's more to thank you about the fact that all this uh, information is available online and it's quite interesting. Well, maybe a question on the very uh, long term. Uh, do you see in a very far future some possibilities for, uh, let's say, editing some of these uh, genes, gene therapy, or it's so far away that you cannot say that it will be uh, in a, well, a possible uh, future, uh, yeah, possible. Uh, that was my first question. And then a, a second question is, uh, um, is there, are there other people who are, let's say, collecting the same kind of uh, information, but uh, keeping it it's, uh, secret? between or you don't know about this. Thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> if they're keeping it secret, <laughs> I wouldn't know about it. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I, I think, um, I mean, certainly uh, there's different kinds of approaches in, in academia. Some people tend to be more open than others. Um, so I guess in terms of genes associated with health and essence, there's um, there's other efforts, um, and, and, you know, using sequencing technologies, for instance, and so on, um, whether, and there has been some published papers, um, Marco De Maria, for instance, in Groningen, they've done some work, Judy Campisi and others at Buck Institute. So there are some data sets out there. They're not secret, but so, so they're out there, for example. So I think there, are, there is actually quite a lot of data in cell senescence um, nowadays, and particularly in vitro. Um, and I would be surprised if there's much secret that you know, we don't know yet. I, I think the big question is, you know, 
what is happening in, in vivo, in particular in human tissues, and that's not something we know very well yet. I mean, what is the physiological relevance of cell senescence in human tissues? I mean, that's that I don't think that's something we can answer yet, and that's the big issue. So when I mean, and going back actually to your first question about gene editing, um, you know, in theory, you could, you could employ gene editing to, to change some of these genes, but is that beneficial or not? That's, that's the big question. I mean, you can, um, you know, uh, you can ablate cell senescence with the telomerase, right? Uh, at least in some cell types. And uh, you can create mice with lots of telomerase and uh, they don't necessarily live longer or I mean, if you want a longer answer, I mean, different labs say different things, but um, so there are some results, I think, from Maria Blasco suggesting they live longer, but other results suggesting that they don't live longer. Well, they still age, let me put it that way. These animals still age um, and die. So even if you ablate cell senescence, uh, it's not, that doesn't cure aging of a whole organism. So yes, it may be possible to, um, edit some of these genes, but do you really want to? Um, or more precisely, I think you may want to in some tissues in some, some circumstances, but not others. And the challenge now is figuring out what are those tissues, what are those genes, and what are the circumstances in which you want to tweak some of these genes? And that, that's, that's a challenge I had in my view. Um, Pedro, if I can add to what you said, one of the analyses we did with the GTEx data when we looked at differentially expressed cell age genes was looking at whether or not some genes were shared between tissues. And for example, we found that uh, CDKN2A, which codes for P16, was overexpressed across um, 10 different tissues with age, which we ran, some, we ran 10,000 simulations and found that no cell age gene, you, you would expect to be differentially expressed in more than three tissues by chance. Genes. So we saw we're like P16 weather. upregulated in 10, NOX4 in eight, um, ZMAT3, which is an inhibitor of senescence was upregulated in seven different tissues with age. So hmm. it's quite interesting to see um, some of these pathways that are sort of systematically differentially expressed across various tissues in human with age. But here's the question though, is that good or bad? So, okay, so you see an upregulation of these genes associated with cell senescence. I mean, we saw that in 2009, um, I think it was P21, if I remember correctly. And uh, we did see it, it is part of our signature of aging, our conserved signature of aging across tissues and mammalian species. So we saw this upregulation of P21. And your first instance is, okay, that's bad for you because, um, because you, uh, uh, you know, cell senescence is bad for you. Is it really? Because you know, maybe those P21 positive cells are there to prevent cancer. And if you eliminate them, you got cancer. So that's the question. Yes, you do see this um, overexpression in some tissues of some genes associated with cell senescence, but is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, to me, that's, that's, that's the big question. It's never simple, is it, biology? The more you drill into it, the further you go, and the more complex it gets, unlike physics, which apparently the deeper you go, the simpler it gets. So I was told. I don't know. But there we go. We've got quite a few questions, actually. Um, there's, some, there's some more coming in uh, from Facebook. I mean, they've just not gotten deep enough in physics. Yeah, Robert is asking... Uh, does Pedro still work in comparative biology? And he's got a question about the bowhead whale as well. Uh, so, so the answer is yes, I still work in comparative biology. I mean, to we've just together with some colleagues in um, in the US and Canada, we sequenced the capuchin monkey genome, which is a long-lived primate lineage. Um, it's available by our archive if you're interested, and uh, the paper is currently submitted for publication. So, so yes, I'm still very interested in looking into why some species live longer and are cancer resistant. Um, we've done some analysis, in particular, uh, uh, Daniela in our lab did some analysis of cancer-related genes and um, 
and their um, evolution across uh, cetaceans, which again, there's a bioarchive preprint on this. Uh, we did some work with Vera Gorbunova and others looking into cell senescence in naked morats, uh, which we published in PNAS, I think, two years ago. So yes, I'm still quite interested in, um, in comparative biology, and we still do, do uh, quite a bigger work on it. Yes, absolutely. As a sort of follow-on, he says, could the bowhead uh, whales be studied as cell cultures as it would be difficult, if not impossible, to study them in vivo? And what about long-lived bats, which could be studied in vivo? So bowhead whales, I've been trying to get cells from the bowhead whales for many years, unsuccessfully. Um, there is a cell line in the US. Uh, there's a paper, I think, from Jerry Shea and Woodring Wright, where they show where they look into cell senescence in bowhead whale cells, um, published, I think, in Aging Cells some year ago. No, some, some not a year ago, <laughs> some years ago, I mean. Um, but I don't have access to those cells. Um, so yes, there are cell cultures of bowhead whale cells. Um, but uh, my lab, I mean, I personally do not have access to them. Um, as for bats, um, yes, I mean, we, we haven't studied bats ourselves. I think it's an interesting animal. Um, could it be studied in vivo? Yes, but they, they, I mean, they had the problem of bats, uh, they, they live quite a long time. Um, they're not particularly easy to keep in captivity. I mean, even naked mole rats, which you can keep in captivity, have this problem that they live over 30 years. So I mean, even if you do a an experiment are you going to wait 30 years for that for you to see the results it's it's not very practical i mean my my approach to these animals is to first compare it with what we know including rodents including uh, other species and and then trying to learn from these animals and apply this knowledge to to more traditional tools so i mean one thing i mentioned um, a couple of years now is i would like to you know get one of these genes potential social will longevity and disease resistance in a bowhead whale and make a mouse with it and see if these animals are long lived and cancer resistant. Um, and that's, I mean, technically it's, it is expensive. That's why I haven't been able to do it because it quite, costs quite a bit of money um, and I don't have the funds to do it, but it is technically feasible to do that. Um, so that's something that um, I think would be a better way to go. Um, obviously, you can study bowhead whales in vivo. Even bats, you can. Um, Imatiling in Dublin, they, they do this kind of studies. They've published quite a few papers last year on this, actually. Um, but it is, it's not a trivial either because of their long lifespans. Yeah, I tend to roam around quite a lot as well, I understand. Forget about. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to uh, circle back to uh, telomeres and just add my two Ps or two cents. There was a study by uh, Blasco and uh, Maria Blasco and, and a number of other people, I think it was last year, or was it the, yeah, it was last year because she gave a talk about it at a conference in New York. And what they found was it wasn't so much the length of telomeres that's important. It was actually the rate at which telomeres wear down that was indicative of uh, longevity. And they did a massive multi-species uh, study and in you know like there were really random things in it like mole rats flamingos and bats and and they found that the commonality between them all was it was the rate at which their telomeres eroded that determined whether they were long lived or not which i think is quite interesting a lot of people think oh long telomeres like, it doesn't really matter how long your telomeres are because it's relative to the species to which you belong so I thought I, I I don't know if you okay. saw that paper, but I thought that that was quite interesting because the rate of the the, the rate of erosion appears to be much more uh, detrimental than than actually just you know shortening per se. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I, I'm familiar with that. I mean, there's been some work years ago already from Mark Hausman in birds showing a similar pattern, um, and there's I think a preprint from Dan Nussi in Edinburgh on this, um, again, showing similar results. So, um, so yes, that, uh, there is a correlation. Um, the question is, is that causative? I mean, is that really driving the process of aging in these animals or is it a reflection of 
you know, differences in growth rates, for instance, differences in, so for example, um, like in mole rat cells, they divide much slower than, um, than mouse cells. So you do see differences between species. And I mean, my hypothesis for quite a long time has been that, okay, if you're a long-lived species like the naked mole rat or like humans, you know, you need to have a, a fairly strict threshold for uh, damage. So if you have DNA damage in your cells, you got to stop, you got to do things properly because you don't want to get cancer later in life. Uh, well, if you're a mouse, it doesn't matter, as, you know, just keep going because you have to, you know, really reach sexual maturity very rapidly and reproduce very rapidly. So you're going to have quality control, basically a quality control procedure in naked mole rat or human cells that you don't, or bowhead cells, that you don't in mouse cells or rat cells. Um, and that's going to be reflected in a lot of other processes. Um, so again, okay, that, and we actually know that happens to some degree. I mean, human cells have cell cycle uh, checkpoints that mouse cells don't have, for instance. So we actually know that's, that's true. Um, so could these differences in telomere shortening be a reflective of that, as opposed to being causal to the aging of these organisms? Um, that's, that's what we don't know. I think it's important also to consider the um, the type of senescence a mouse might undergo versus a a human. Given the telomeres are longer, perhaps mice are less prone to I don't know replicative senescence than um, stress induced senescence or oncogene induced senescence, for example. Um, it's not really clear from from what we saw from the Selage manuscript was that. P, P16 was the most commonly um, overexpressed cell age gene across different tissues in human with age, which um, from my understanding is more linked to a stress response rather than replicative senescence. So it's quite interesting um, that we see that specifically because we've been digging now into, as Pedro mentioned earlier, single cell mouse aging data, and we're not necessarily seeing that increase in P16, which isn't, it's not very clear to us why, but um, it could be a species specific effect. We're not sure. It's also interesting that uh, when you epigenetically reprogram, or partially, I should say, it resets the telomeres anyway. So are the telomeres merely an indication of genomic stability and rather than a driver, who knows? I've got a feeling we might find out within the next decade. So, but I mean, they're, they are obviously a proposed hallmark of aging, but I honestly think the epigenetic uh, alterations are the stronger of the two and it kind of pulls the telomeres along with it for the ride. If it, if you were, because you know, when you, when you use Yamanaka factors, it, uh, it definitely relengthens them. It effectively resets them. Not all of them, but quite a, a, quite a few of them, which is significant, right? So, I don't know. We've got a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of questions here, actually. Uh, Greg Grinsberg asks, uh, he says, a possibly naive question with regard to the indications you saw that eliminating senescent cells may be detrimental in mice. Were you able to separate the absence of the cells from their elimination? In other words, could the detrimental effects observed have come from compounds released from the cells as they were eliminated? So, so first of all, so the detrimental um, effects of eliminating senescent cells is not our work. That's the work of other labs. So, so I would refer to these papers. Mm -hmm. the, the work from Dimitri, if I remember correctly, um, they basically show that senescent cells play a role in... Um, you know, in, in, in the vascular system, um, particularly in the liver, Roberto, correct me if I'm mistaken, um, but basically uh, yes, is in the liver, right? So, so basically when you eliminate senescent cells, you got, um, uh, it disrupts the, 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 the integrity of the vascular system. Uh, that's my recollection. So it's like a structural role, if I remember correctly. But again, I, I will refer to the paper from Dimitri, which was published in Cell Metabolism just a few weeks ago, if I remember uh, correctly. So, so that would go into more details. I don't think the issue was um, 
compounds released from the cells. I think the issue was a structural role of the cells in the vascular system. That's, that's my recollection. To be fair, it didn't really even seem to me that the cells the being senescent was the issue. It was more of the fact that the senescent cells had a specific cell structure that when they cleared with the senolytic, um, the liver could no longer maintain that same cell population. It would replace those um, senescent cells that were cleared with another population of cells that didn't maintain the same structure. So yeah, I don't even necessarily know if it had to do with senescence, the fact that these mice got ill or the fact that they couldn't specifically replicate the structure of these cells. There's a lot of unknowns. I'm gonna, I'm gonna default to the standard researcher <laughs> answer to that. More, more research is needed. We need more funding for the research. More, more funding as well, please. It's, so, a, it's always one of my conclusions from my talks. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I, I mean, think it's a conclusion from everyone's <laughs> talks. <laughs> In fact, I can't re recall uh, many papers that don't always end with, yes, but of course, more research is always needed. It, it always, it's always needed. You know, scientists have got a paper mm -hmm. their copy somehow, right? Although I was once told that a scientist is a machine into which you put coffee and outcome hypothesis if he's interested yes. so there we go i should get that on a t-shirt we should sell those t-shirts right let's see what else we've got we've got loads here uh, uh donovan says i'm curious about the cell age database from a tool perspective uh Jao mentioned that he'd love to see additional data sets added uh does it support expansion both in the number of data sets and adding comparisons example could uh oh example could be valuable to have a more specific chemical environment uh regards gene expression when that becomes easier to do that's quite a technical one uh yeah so so i mean you cannot do expansions yourself but we are always looking to collaborate with others and to expand our databases. So, so absolutely. I mean, if that, I mean, if you have ideas, drop me a line and uh, uh, happy to discuss. That's a pretty, uh, a pretty good response there, but then that's, that's classic Pedro. He's always very open to collaboration. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, well we, can't, it, we, we, we can't cure aging by ourselves. <laughs> well, we, we are expanding on the cell age database. So I took a few months to compile build two, which we're not done yet, but is around 933 genes now, actually. So we've actually tripled the size of cell age, more than tripled. So uh, the next question is kind of relating to that. And I'm sure it might make Pedro uh, laugh a little bit here. It's made me chuckle, but uh, Martin O'D asks, uh, has there has there been any interact have there been any interactions with Calico in terms of sharing data sets and they're returning some of their findings? Well, I'm already laughing because this is Calico. They're more secret than the uh, United States Secret Service. <laughs> have you heard anything uh, from them? So no. so I know a couple of people at Calico. Um I mean, all of our data is, is uh, I mean, the sellage data is available. <laughs> Anyone can collect it. You know, you know, you can download it, you can obtain it, and the paper is published. So, so you, uh, all of the data sets are there. So there's no, <laughs> they can, I mean, Calico or any researcher or any company can get our data without telling me about it or expecting to give me anything in return. Um, so, so I would say, I mean, I know some people at Calico, uh, whether they're using our data sets or not, I, I don't know <laughs> would be the short answer, but they can use it if they want, like anyone else in the world can. And have they shared anything with you? Anything? <laughs> We're using so secretive. Some... We're using some Calico single cell data, but that's available mm. to everyone, I think. Uh, yeah, this is some a public experiments. available data set, yes. From what so, we've seen so we're, so we're in touch far, with some of them, yes. Yeah, so what we've seen so far from Calico is they, they've been very uh, secretive. We don't really know what they're working on. Uh, they've done a few publications, things about naked mole rats, but most people uh, seem to be 
less than enthusiastic about their contribution so far. Uh, my personal view is they're busy using big data and adding to the basic foundational knowledge. So I actually think that broadly what they're doing is still useful. So I'm going to reserve judgment because you never know what Google are doing. So we, the, the long and short of it is we don't know what they're doing, folks. Unfortunately, we don't know what they're doing. So, so there we go. I don't know if anybody else is, uh, anybody else have any uh, questions in the in the chat here or no, everyone shy today. So I'm going to ask uh, a question, which I'm often asked by people right now. Obviously, I'm not looking for brand endorsements, but there, there's a there's a huge amount of choice when it comes to these these home genetic test kits. You know, you can find out whether you're related to, I don't know, Vlad the Impaler or, you know, some other famous person. So are we really there in your view? Um, it, is it worth bothering at this point in time? Because I understand that some of these, these kits, uh, they're, not, they're not full sequences. Is the information that we're getting from them regards like ancestry and things like that? Is it really at the point where we can, we, we think it's useful or is it not? Anything so, I mean, I, I can tell you my personal case. I mean, I did the 23andMe tests already several years ago. Um, it's not very expensive. It's not very cumbersome. It's not very painful. You, you basically spit into a little um, container and send it to them. So hmm. uh, I don't remember how much I paid, but I don't think it was very expensive. So I thought it was worth it. It gives you some disease risk. It doesn't radically change your life. But um, I found out I had a higher percentage of Neanderthal DNA than 98% of the people. So you know, yes, I'm a bit of a caveman myself, as you can probably tell. Um, so I think it's interesting, but it certainly doesn't give you all the answers because we don't know well that a lot of genetic variants we don't know what they do. I mean, there's a lot of genetic variants that may be even associated with diseases, but even if they're associated, we don't know how to counteract them or how how that uh, plays out from a you know lifestyle perspective, for instance. So uh, I think it's interesting. I mean, uh, then again, I do a lot of work in genetics, so I, I think it's interesting that, really. regardless. Mm. Um, so I thought it was interesting. Uh, but then, of course, it's a it's a personal choice. Yeah. So there you have it. There you have it. Um, I'm thinking about doing it myself. Um, to be to be fair, but uh, it'll probably reveal nothing nothing overly exciting. It'll be like, hey, you've got Irish, you've got you know, you've got a bit of German, you've got some Slav in you, you know. And I'm like, okay, well, I already thought that anyway. So, well, I've got the blue eyes, which are uh, blue eyes, a herk a HERC2 gene mutation, which apparently gives me blue eyes, and my common ancestor has allegedly been traced to the Black Sea about 10,000 years ago. So I'll be very surprised if I don't have at least some Slavic uh, genetic... In fact, I'll be shocked. <laughs> so there you go, and maybe some Scandinavian as well. So there you go. Didier says the best job in the world is the press officer for Calico. That's a good point. That would be a quiet job, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, dear. But yes, uh, best kept secret in longevity is what Calico. I'd love to find out what they're up to. So there we go. Just having a look through, see what else we've got. Yeah, I think we've got pretty much most of it. Uh, I'm going to attempt to say this name. I'm, apologies in advance. Uh, Marela Maritza says, in the case of the uh, of, in the case of the uterus, uh, it may be any maybe any relation with changes in hormones with age that gives a protective response to senescence in this organ. Maybe. Um. <laughs> Maybe I, I, it's it's not something we looked into. I mean, we don't we don't actually study the uterus. It just came up as an outlier in our in our analysis. I, I do think it's 
I, I think it's interesting, but we haven't looked into it. We, as I said before, you do see it from a physiological perspective, there is an increase in cell proliferation in the uterus in older women. Um, whether that's hormonal or not, I, I don't know. It also wasn't the only exception. I think colon was also an exception in our data. It showed the opposite trend. So it wasn't just the uterus. No, that's true. It was the strongest um, exception, but not the only one. The thymus, I think, was an exception as well. Mm -hmm. So there were a couple of exceptions. Yes, good point. The thymus is interesting. So, but then again, I suppose it, it, it could be a question of prioritizing uh, critical areas of the body. Um, you know, the thymus being, I'd argue that it's probably one of the most important organs in the body, probably next to the brain and the heart. I mean, I wouldn't want to make a a top 10 organs list. I mean, that would be a bit weird, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it's in my top five. There you go, folks. It's like top of the But, pops, but the it? uterus is not actually used anymore after menopause. Mm -hmm. You don't need a uterus after menopause. Yeah, this, it is weird, isn't it? It's strange. That is really weird. Hmm. Oh, uh, Donovan says a quick thought about inverse expression in ovaries could have to do with reproductive life cycle length similar to children of older males having longer telomeres. Mm. Well, I mean, if the reproductive cycle is finished, what would be the point in? keeping it going yeah i don't know i mean I, I i guess you would need you could look into the reproductive lifespan and how it correlates but you need a lot more data to do that so uh, short answer is i don't know <laughs> it's more research needed folks more yes. research but that i mean you know we, we we could we could say that about most things okay i'm just having a look to see if you've got oh, any more Robert mentions that some of the genetic testing had some disturbing privacy issues. Um, and I was going to mention U-Biome as well, um, which is actually uh, interesting because it takes uh, microbiome samples and looks at that. But again, there were some serious privacy concerns with that. So I would say do your homework and, you know, make sure, you, make sure you're safe before you do any of that. But, uh, but there we go. Okay, yeah, well, um, yeah, and it looks like um, I don't think anybody else has got any questions. I think we've covered all bases. Well, thank you for organizing okay. this. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, I mean, as I said, any suggestions or if anyone wants to contribute, you know, to collaborate, drop, drop, drop us an email. It would be great to, uh, to work. There you go. So open invitation he's one of the most approachable Just people this, in uh... this makes me think to maybe a last question so or, or so uh, do you work with uh, anton kulaga sometimes or because he's uh, yes, yes, I know anton uh, we we've uh, we, we've met at a conference in Moscow just just end of last year so so yes we we do so and he works with Robbie, who was my former postdoc with whom we'd collaborate so so yes we we work at anton yes thanks again for. All the information. My pleasure. So uh, there we go. Hopefully, we 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 may see you in person uh, later the, later this year at uh, Undoing Aging. Um, which, Fingers crossed. Yes, hope, I, hope to see you gonna, there. Yeah, I'm actually going to say I'm quietly confident that that will, against all the odds, uh, I think it could be happening. Um, it's looking very promising in in Germany uh, with the uh, with the COVID situation. Uh, I'm not really going to say much about the UK situation. Uh, let's just say um, I think it's been a little bit subpar, and I won't get into the politics. But it is looking pretty positive that we could be allowed to travel to Germany by October, which is great news. Um, so we may well see you there, hopefully. Hopefully, yes. And, Hope to see you there. Yeah, and hopefully uh, 
Oliver as well, if he's allowed out to play. I don't know. I was about, I was about to say, probably no such luck for U.S. citizens being permitted yeah. to go to the EU. I'm going to be honest, it's, it isn't looking good because I know in the um, UK news... If they've, they are, they've, they've revoked our EU visa. Yeah, we've got a 14-day quarantine here. Although, I think tomorrow they announced uh, all the agreements with the EU and the UK. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of travel in between the countries in, 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 in Europe there. So that's positive. Things are getting better. So fingers crossed we'll all be there in October. But uh, we, we are doing uh, something else, aren't we? Before that, Oliver, aren't we? Um, we're a little, another little conference. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if you want to say a few words about it, but we have our own shindig, our ending age-related diseases conference, which uh, we were planning on a spectacular in the flesh conference in New York City, our third annual, and uh, you know it's been growing and growing, and we had it all set up to go at uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and uh, and you know unfortunately everything hit the fan globally and uh you know for safety reasons we decided very early on to you know shift gears and uh we took an executive board decision to move everything online uh which uh seems to be you know, now in hindsight a good choice um because uh you know everybody's talking about at least here in the united states uh you know things have gone down now they're going back up again it's a bit of a seesaw so um in August is still unpredictable, and uh, but we are having our conference um, online. Um, August, I believe, is the 20 and 21st. Am I getting those two dates right? I know it's, uh, I believe, one of the dates I might have heard. It is uh, the 20th, 21st of August. Yes. And as you say, it's online, so that means everybody can can join in. We've got, we've just announced a whole bunch of uh, new speakers as well. Um, so we've got really quite a lot of uh, uh, speakers. I've, I've put the uh, the link up in the uh, Facebook chat if anybody wants to check that out. But uh, yeah, so it does give people the opportunity who perhaps couldn't visit the US in previous years. At least they can get involved uh, this way. And honestly, I think I think virtual is is it sounds a bit cliche, but I think virtual interaction is the future. Um, and I think you're going to be seeing more of that or perhaps hybrid events where you're going to have some online and, and some physical. So I don't, that's, there you go. That's my hot prediction. So there you go. So hopefully uh, you'll join us uh, there. There'll be all sorts. There'll be the usual things. There'll be talks and interviews and all kinds of exciting things uh, and other things going on during the intervals. No Tom and Jerry cartoons, unfortunately. I've, I got uh, that idea was shot down. I'm not telling you who suggested it. Could have been me. So there we are. So hopefully we'll see you there. And um, Journal Club next uh, next month uh, is also another special. We've got uh, Mike Lusgarden. He's going to be joining us. And he did the one about the biomarkers last time. But this time he's going to be exploring... The actual microbiome and all the all the, the the things inside our guts, the the bacteria and all sorts. So that 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 should be exciting. But uh, hmm, have your lunch first. So anyway, or maybe not actually. No, actually don't. No, don't. don't never mind. Anyway, so, so that's going on. <laughs> so I'm actually really excited about our upcoming conference. I I don't know. I know that there's a lot of we're, we're doing something pretty sophisticated for our online conference. It's not going to be like a, a Sims type of event, mm. right? Where everybody's got a virtual car. I don't know. How, how, how is it actually? <laughs> it's not quite, uh, it, it, no. it's not quite second <laughs> life. If people, God, I'm showing my age now. It's not quite second life. Mm. Um, but it, it, it is not just um, for anybody thinking that it, it, it's just going to be um, a, a chat like this. It's not far from it. There are actually lots of virtual rooms with uh, there's going to be a poster session. There's all sorts of things going on. And uh, oh, and Joe's uh, off. Thank you very much uh, for, Thanks, for, for that uh, jab. And we'll see you soon. But yeah, it's going to be all, all sorts of stuff going on, like 
as close to a physical conference as we can possibly get. So there'll be like side rooms, exhibitions, on-demand uh, video, all kinds of things. So, yeah. And also I would like to say that there is a free ticket available, which allows you to view some of the content. So do sign up, even if you only can join us for that. Come along and uh, check it out. There should be some interesting stuff. And it also includes a, uh, I think it's a three hour work, uh, biotech workshop, which is part of the free ticket. And that's hosted, that was something we ran last year, hosted by Kelsey Moody, Dr. Kelsey Moody now. And his, uh, he, he runs ICOR and a number of other aging research companies. Honestly, even if you can't make the whole conference, come along for those three three hours if you're in any way thinking about starting up a biotech because it's literally how to how to set up and run a biotech in a box three hours of your life totally not wasted so there you go from somebody who is successful in running biotech. so there you go kelsey one of my favorite people and i'm not just saying that because you sent me some money no he didn't really he is a genuinely, uh, genuinely uh, nice guy, and he's extremely knowledgeable about, you know, the trials, tribulations of starting up a biotech company. So, uh, just register, and his knowledge could be yours. So that's great. So I think that's about it for this edition. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined us online on on Facebook, and also in the chat today as well to our heroes who are all here with us and. Uh, Without them, we wouldn't be able to do shows like this and all the other wonderful things that we do, like the X10, Life X10 show and all kinds of things. So, yeah, big thank you to them. And if you'd like to support our work, you can learn more about that at lifespan.io forward slash hero. So there we are. And with that said, stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks so everybody. much for everything. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Roberto. Thanks very much.